Hello and welcome to The Front Page. It's Monday, May 15, and I'm your host, Racing Post editor Tom Kerr. Ahead of us, 30 minutes packed with incisive racing debate. And um, with us in the studio, uh, making his front page debut, uh, Racing Post reporter Matt Rennie. Welcome, Matt. And regular Matty Playo, writer, broadcaster, tipster extraordinaire. And on video, the busiest man in racing journalism, uh, Deputy Island editor David Jennings. Welcome. I, I, I'd love Maddie's introduction if possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to have to keep working at that. Uh, yeah, okay, I know. let's get down to business. We're going to start. We're going to start with you, DJ, um, because you're going to tell us about a big story which we've been at the forefront of over the last uh, week or two: uh, upheaval in Irish media rights. Take it away, please. Yeah, so it's been quite a dramatic week over here on the media rights front. Um, so there's a big EGM of the Association of Irish Racecourse on Tuesday where they had to vote uh, for or against the RMG SAS media rights deal, which is a five-year contract from 2024 to 2028. And five tracks rejected the deal. So this is the um, United Irish Racecourses, as they call themselves. So it's Kilbegan, Limerick, Sligo, Roscommon and Thurlis have rejected the deal. And they have written to the Minister for Agriculture, Food and Marine, which is Charlie McConnell, uh, asking him basically to intervene here. Um, they're not happy, basically, that Horse Racing Ireland are getting directly £7 million in, 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 in monies from this deal. And that what they say is that Irish uh, tracks, which are owned by Horse Racing Ireland, will get seven-figure sums on top of that. So they're not happy. They think they can do. Uh, they can get a. Be- they should be getting a better deal. And I think their main gripe is basically that they, they feel that the bigger tracks, the 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 Grade One tracks, are are doing much better out of this deal than tracks like themselves. And uh, um, it's a performance based deal, uh, which basically means that how many streams of each race um, goes to the track. So it's it's you're basically dealing on success and. And um, what's very interesting about this is on Friday, uh, Suzanne Eid, who is the chief executive of Horse Racing Ireland, uh, has basically come out all guns blazing against these five Irish racetracks. Um, this uh, deal for the 21 of the 26 tracks was uh, approved by the board of Horse Racing Ireland on uh, on Friday. And Suzanne has, um, let's just say, she's not held back in her criticism of the five tracks for failing to stay united with uh, with the other 21 and and there's some there's some um really strong quotes from suzanne um on friday uh just to pick out some of them uh like she basically explains the deal as well which is quite interesting she said there are significant safeguards built into the new arrangements for race courses with each venue guaranteed its 20 2022 average price uh per race income and uh, there's an easing in provision that has also been included for the first three years of the of the new deal to assist smaller race courses as the model moves to a turnover basis. Uh, virtually all race courses are forecast to achieve higher revenues in 2025 than at present. And this was probably the main line in her press release. She says any attempt to paint the tender process as unfair or the distribution or the distribution model as unjust is either lacking. A basing a basic understanding of the media rights landscape or is misrepresenting the facts so Suzanne is not happy that the 26 Irish tracks have not stayed united um, a policy that she thought helped everybody get through COVID and the challenges um, of, of a cost of living crisis so um, it's very interesting Tom so the next step now is basically it looks as though ARC and uh, Sky Sports Racing are going to step in they're going to pitch for coverage of the five other race courses which is 56 meetings uh, a year which i think calculates maybe 15 percent so it's going to be interesting there was rumors of an unsolicited offer of 100,000 per meeting for these tracks so um if they can obviously get that deal it will be obviously good for them but um who knows what's going to happen now it's going to obviously enter uh, a new stage yeah Great summary there, DJ. And I guess, you know, there's, there's two sort of major factors coming out of this. The first is the implications for the uh, Irish racing industry and whether this is going to ultimately generate more value, more revenues for the tracks affected. And I guess 
that's something that's only going to become clear over time. The second factor, and the one which is going to be of most interest to Racing Post readers, is what it means for watching Irish racing. Uh, and basically, you've, you've alluded to it there, the likelihood is that these tracks return to Sky Sports Racing, assuming a deal can be done. Uh, what's your take on that, DJ? Good news or bad news? I, I don't know. It's it, it's quite interesting. Um, obviously, Sky came out on on fr on Thursday, I think, or Friday, uh, basically to say that they are very much interested in talking to these tracks and uh, trying to come to some arrangement. Um, I suppose there are people who would would absolutely one hundred percent say that Irish racing was better when it was on at the races. I know I spoke to Eddie Leary, Eddie O'Leary, last week, and Eddie just thinks that um, racing TV has so much racing that basically. It's it's what he calls betting shop fodder, and it's race to race to race to race. Whereas at the races, used to show kind of behind the scenes stories in Irish racing, and and more get behind into the that element of it. Now Sky Sports Racing have a lot of racing as well, so um, whether that argument holds up, I don't know. But if they are covering just say uh, you know a Kilbegan on a Friday night, there will be a lot of time in between races and a lot of time during the duration of that meeting obviously to fill in little slots with with um coverage of stuff like that maybe behind the scenes elements and and, and different features but i am surprised they, they have rejected this deal tom i have to say overall like it's like i think the figure being quoted at the minute is, is 47 million a year like irish media rights is in a very good place like and uh, that's what suzanne Eid basically said la um last week as well like like this is something that has done very well over the years. The Media Rights Committee um, has negotiated terrific deals for Irish racing, and you can see the percentage that it has increased by in the, in the five years and five years again. Um, it seems like the Media Rights Committee, to me personally, have done a very good job, and they've negotiated an extremely good deal. And from speaking to race course managers who have actually signed this deal, they, they're, they're scratching their heads going, what's going on here with these other five race courses? We are getting a terrific deal here which is the fairest way of sorting out who gets what proportion of the pie. And they're still not happy. And these race course managers just can't really understand it. So obviously the five tracks who are part of the United Irish race courses feel that they deserve more. And that's the reason why they've re rejected the deal. There's a lot more to that, to this deal that we will never know. Negotiations that have happened behind closed doors. We will never know the ins and outs of it. But from an outsider looking in, I'm very surprised that the, 26 tracks haven't stayed together and the five tracks have went their own way. Fascinating. Thank you very much, DJ. Media rights, of course, so central to the racing business model. And uh, David and his colleagues and I are doing a fantastic job of explaining all the machinations behind the scenes uh, as this deal has been uh, uh, signed or not signed, as the case may be. Uh, we have got bags and bags of stuff to get through. So Maddie, I'm going to move straight on to your story. Um, and we're going to the other side of the world for something which made headlines, I think, around the racing world, really. Uh, take it away, please. Yes. Uh, Three-time British champion jockey Sylvester D'Souza was handed a 10-month ban by the Hong Kong Jockey Club officials um, for facilitating a fellow rider um, betting on a race, which is, of course, forbidden. That goes under their rule 59. Uh, the rider in question was Wagner Borges. Um, he pleaded guilty and um, received this 10-month ban and now the future for the 42-year-old is looking very muddy indeed. Mm. Um, he stated his intention, well perhaps not intention, but he stated his uneasiness at the situation in Hong Kong before this happened um, and that he was homesick and he was struggling quite a bit with the environment. He's found it difficult to adapt. I spoke to him when I was out there in December um, and he's received a lot of hefty bans um, so for all intents and purposes this seems like it could be the nail in the coffin of, of his Hong Kong career and whether he'll come back to Britain um, to try and rebuild those bridges and um, continue what has been an incredibly successful career um, up to this point. This is a um, you know the first of, of such offences for him uh, it's the longest ban uh, that the Hong Kong Jockey Club have handed out since Nash Rawilla in 2018, which was a 15-month sentence. Um, and yeah, Sylvester, it's been announced this morning, is going to appeal. 
Um, and we believe, given that he pleaded guilty, he's appealing the severity and the mm. length of this ban. Um, but given what we know about previous cases of this nature in Hong Kong, which, is, as we know, is one of the most ruthlessly competitive um, and uh, well-stewarded racing jurisdictions around the globe, um, I'd be very surprised if he was having much more success that you know he has done already this season. He's rode a couple of Group 3 wins aboard a horse called Money Catcher, um, who's been sort of a real uh, help to him in his quest to um, establish relationships out in Hong Kong. And he's not been doing too badly when he has been riding, but uh, he's spent more of the time outside of the saddle, and, and this is just an extension of that. So it's going to be fascinating to see. Obviously, Sylvester's had a, a very up and down career um, with his relationship with King Power Racing. That came to an end, and, and Hong Kong looked like it was a, a new challenge for him, and he looked to be thriving on it. But... Um, yeah, that's, that's sadly going to come to a close now. And I wonder how he'll get on if he comes back to this country, mm. given how fast things change and the relationships that jockeys have. You know, we saw it last year. So many riders and trainers partnered ways, owners with retainerships. We know how volatile they can be. Um, so his future is really up in the air at the moment. So just to go to the ban in Hong Kong, um, First of all, we, 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 should, we should be completely clear that there was no suggestion that there was any sort of wrongdoing in the race. It was purely no. that, 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 that his colleague placed a bet and he apparently facilitated that bet being placed in some way. As you say, he, he, he pled guilty. He's now appealing which what we believe is the severity of the ban. But knowing how things in Hong Kong work, basically he's not going to ride in Hong Kong again. They won't Mm -hmm. very unlikely to give him a license given the way they approach the integrity of their of their sport over there that's correct yeah absolutely that's what i'd be assuming um and as you say they they did um look at the incident the races in question and and said that both jockeys did all they could to obtain best possible placing as far as they were aware but as you said tom i'd be very very surprised if if he ever rode in in hong kong after this yeah and the, and the horse that they bet on it should also be said finished i think seventh yeah, so young, brilliant. Yeah, not a great bet. Um, <laughs> probably worth 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 noting. But let's say Matt, he does come back to the UK. Um, Matty summed it up. You know, very up and down career. Uh, you know, he's been champion jockey. He rode for Godolphin. He had the King Power. But then also between these, his periods of not really being necessarily in fashion, if you like. Um, you know, how do you rate him, and how do you see his return to the UK, assuming it happens, going? I think it will be incredibly tough because the pool of jockeys we've got over here at the minute with the young ones coming through, it's, there's a lot of jockeys there for a really small pool of, of, of trainers, really. You know, you look at James Doyle and William Buick already retained for Godolphin, King Power have scaled down, obviously he's not going to be riding for them anymore after the retainer ended a couple of seasons ago. And he needs to come back, really, with, he's got a clean slate and he's got to try and we rebuild these relationships he had. Obviously, he rode for Mark Johnston previously about 10 years ago. Now it's obviously Charlie in charge. So it'd be really interesting to see what way he wants to take his career. He's obviously, he's 42 now. He's not at the, the pinnacle of his career. He's coming, seeing the twilight of his career coming in. I know his son is riding out in Newmarket as well. Mm. And so he might be thinking, you know, he's going to come back for a couple more seasons, but it's going to be incredibly tough for him. And he said Hong Kong, Maddie said, rightly said, it felt like a real good opportunity. And, and, and that's gone now completely. And it will be interesting to see what he, what he can do and with the relationships he's, he saved. But up before he went to Hong Kong, it was a little bit of a struggle. If you think Winter Power was his sole group one winner for King Power in his final season, and then, then the, the quality rides weren't there. So mm. it will be interesting to see. And I think we will hope, hope, for, hope for the best that he can, he can ride as well as he can do when he, when he returns. But it's going to be a really tough, tough gig with the pool of riders we've currently got in Britain. And DJ, just finally, your take on this one. You know, how do you rate Sylvester as a jockey? And you know, do you rate his chances of re-establishing himself if he returns? Yeah, he's forty-two. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting because, um, like, it's a completely different. Uh, I, I will agree with him on, on one thing. It is completely different Hong Kong. The way the race in Hong Kong and Maddie. Maddie would know that as well. Like it's a completely different way of doing things, and it's a different style of riding almost. But um, if he does come back to Britain, I'd imagine. I I don't know what his relationship with Mark Johnson is like, but you'd imagine that would be the kind of fit for him. Um, I know Mark uses maybe two, three, four different jockeys. Even last season, he was using Jason Hart a lot. Um, you'd imagine that he would naturally, given the the numbers that that Charlie Johnson. 
um, has at the moment. You'd imagine he would probably fit in there somewhere if the relationship is still decent. Um, that, that's If he does obviously come back and, and set up again in Britain, I'd imagine it will be uh, the Johnson team that he would be linking up with. But that's a guess. I, I don't really know how the relationship is, but that's the kind of that would be the, the fit I would see for him. Be an interesting one to see a very topsy turvy career at Sylvester de Souza. He's hit some incredible heights, and um, you wouldn't necessarily back against him to pull it off again. Uh, before we move to our next story, uh, a quick mid uh, episode break for an advert for Racing Post Members Club uh, beginning now. And welcome back. Uh, so we're now going to go to Matt, making your debut on the show. What's your story? Well, I think the only way we can look at it on the track from what's been happening the last week is, is the classic picture, really. It's just blown wide open in, in many cases. Maybe not so with the Oaks after Save the Last Dance's mm. incredible win in the Cheshire Oaks. 22 lengths in the end, which is more akin to a two-mile hurdle race in, in the depths of December rather than a, a spring trial for a classic. Um, but there was the Derby picture is still murky, really. There's mm. no other way of putting it, really. Um, the trials this week at Chester, well, last week, sorry, at Chester and Lingfield, both affected by the weather, one so much so at Lingfield that they had to race on the all-weather surface in the end, and Chester's was was very much a bog in the end, really. Um, we saw some good winners and ones that we th who could stay claiming the classics, but it's still wide open. I mean, military order won well on the all-weather at Lingfield in the Derby trial, going one better than his brother did, Adair two mm. years ago before he went and won the uh, derby. And obviously a rest as well could be Frankie de Torre's dream derby final ride, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? He was an impressive winner of the Chester Vars. However, as I said, that was a, it was a gruelling contest, really, and one which to the eye didn't look as satisfactory as you'd hope for a trial. The race fell apart. The race behind, completely fell it, apart. Yeah. And, and one thing I noted was he, a rest looks like a relentless galloper. Mm. However... For Epsom, sometimes you do need a horse that has that turn of foot, like we saw with Desert Crown last year when he kicked at the two furlong pole and went, went clear and, and scorched clear. Same with Adair, whereas it was just the ground sort of, it leaves a difficult picture. Mm. And obviously with what happened to August Rodin in the Guineas as well, and it was interesting last week that Aidan said that he still is number one for the derby despite what happened in the 2000 Guineas. Yeah. It just leaves a picture of, of a guessing game still, really. Obviously, we've got some... Trials still to come. We've got what looks to be a brilliant Dante stake shaping up to be at York this mm. week. And that might be the one, the key race to provide a real clear picture on the derby. Yeah, but clear as mud right now um, and plenty of mud in the picture as well. Um, let's take Chester first of all, Maddie. Um, we had two impressive winners in Save the Last Dance. Save the Last Dance, 64 for the Oaks. Is that, is that right? Is that right after the conditions the race was running? Uh. I think so. We were guests. I was there at Chester. It's my first visit to the track, um, and I was blown away by her. Mm. Um, the speed in which she went past the winning post was extraordinary. She just kept quickening away and accelerating. Uh, and I was sort of guessing maybe she'd be two to one for for the Oaks. And I think she was about that after the race, but she's shortened since. Um, I'd certainly probably say that two to one would be a bit big now. So perhaps it is fair enough. Um, I was speaking to um, Tom Siegel yesterday actually and he said to me he thinks the Phillies are a lot better than the Colts this year which I thought was quite interesting. Um, I think she's very very good. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a couple of Phillies came out and um, the Musidora this week could be quite informative regarding the Oaks. Um, especially considering this year's 1000 Guineas might not have um, a bearing on the, on the Oaks itself. As for the Derby, yeah, muddling picture. I really mm. like what Military Order did. I think I was probably more impressed than plenty were by what he did at Lingfield. Um, got that dream split up the inside. Um, and I think he just reminds me so much of his brother. Um, he's got that powerful physique, yet he's got the agility to handle Lingfield's tight all-weather track, which surely bodes well for Epsom. Um, the one I've got my eye on for the Derby as well is uh, Sir Michael Stouts again. 
Uh, he's supplemented passenger for the Dante. Um, could he also supplement him for the Derby and make it two wins in a row? I, I think that horse has um, he's certainly got a lot more to offer. Whether he's, he's going to be good enough and whether he's going to be quite well equipped enough for Epsom and that test at this stage in his career remains to be seen, but we'll find out a lot more this week. Um, I think it's great. I think it's great for racing that we're analysing these races and, and there's not sort of a, a strong viewpoint that everyone thinks that you know, one horse is going to win. I think that's what's the beauty of our sport is trying to figure out the puzzle of the derby. Um, and yeah, this year's race should be shaping up really well. Yes, yeah, it is intriguing. And, and, and Matt, you touched on the, the change of surface at Lingfield as well. I mean, military order, super impressive. Um, bred to be a derby winner for sure. But what do, you, what do you make of that switch of surface? How much does that sort of downgrade that form if it does not if it does at all in your eyes? From, from a punter's perspective, I've I find it quite unsatisfactory, really, mm. switching to an all-weather surface. I'd love to see a horse go on the turf before the big race, before a classic. Fair play to Lingfield for salvaging the card, because if they had run it on the turf on really heavy conditions, it could have been detrimental for those wanting to run, a, or run in the classic, in the derby, in a, in a few weeks' time. And a, but it probably left a mark in their own trial if they'd run yeah. it on, on Lingfield heavy as well, which, you know, is, is really testing. But I think fair play for saving it, but it, it wasn't the mo it's not going to be the most sort of there's a question trial. mark over that. There's a question yeah. mark, and, and yeah. Maddie's right in saying with military order, he's a he's a big horse, he's a gawky horse. So Lingfield's all weather surface, well track, which is all about that speed off the home term, shouldn't have suited him. So you can definitely mark up his performance for for what he did then. He, he, he did get the dream run through turning in though. He certainly did, and I think the runner up. Uh, I you think know. he's a good horse. Yeah. yeah, I think he's a really good horse. And I, I think like Ed Walker said after the race that he's better than English King, who. Finished yeah. mid mid well midfield, but was sent off favourite for that. Uh, the that first a return that's a striking derby. quote. A striking mm. quote. Um, it's worth, sorry, Tom. It's yeah, worth mentioning the the filly as well wasn't even in the Oaks uh, Eternal Hope Indeed. who won that trial. Um, so maybe they'll choose to supplement her as well. It's it's a, a merry go round of who's going to pay up the money. Absolutely, cards in the air and uh, bumper supplementary fees for Epsom. Good news for prize money, DJ. Uh, you and I so often. You and Aidan O'Brien, I believe, are on lockstep on your view on the derby. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny, Tom. I don't know what's the first thing you do every morning, uh, and maybe I don't want to know. <laughs> but uh, this is, uh, hopefully my wife isn't listening, but the first thing I do is check my phone for Twitter. And uh, I woke up this morning, and it was quite funny because I was scrolling through, and then I see Sporting Life had tweeted, Armin, Ben Linfoot is struggling to remember a worse derby favourite than Augusto then. So I just read a, a couple of lines from the piece, and he says, it's difficult to remember a worse derby favourite than Augusto then. I look at his current derby odds of around 4-1 to one with genuine astonishment. There is nothing this horse has ever done to merit such prices, and the evidence is right there in the form book. So Ben actually does, in fairness, make a valid point, but it's quite interesting because I did a column on Friday and I said that the 13 Tate about Augusto for the for the 2000 Guineas was a ridiculous price, but I don't think the five to one for the Derby is a ridiculous price. And this is completely playing the man, not the ball. Um, it is astonishing when you speak to Aiden and when you speak to anybody in the yard, TJ Comerford, uh, you know, uh, anybody that's in or around the yard and, and know what's going on. I even spoke to Joseph, who was at Nace the day the 2000 guineas was on I said which because I really fancied little big bear and I said which of the two like do you think might win it and he looked at me and he goes so you know what I'm going to say like it was like as if in the Bally Doyle camp and everybody surrounding the camp that there was only one possible outcome certainly with their two colts who both ran shockers but like they can't all be wrong like they can't I know from a punting point of view and people will say don't you know, the form book is there. This horse has run an absolute shocker in the 2000 guineas. Maybe he didn't win a great first in Futurity either. And he is a ridiculous favourite. On the form book, he is. But it is very, very strange, Tom, just talking to Aiden and even his interview uh, during the week after the, the D stakes with San Antonio, how it was like Hayley Moore asked him, you know, is 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 it potentially San Antonio ahead of uh, Augusto Rodin in your pecking order now? Or... or a question to that kind of regard and it was almost as if it was like how dare you ask such a question like obviously Aiden is far more politer than that and he went into the positives about Augusto then but it is baffling how poorly he ran in the 2000 guineas and the point I made was if he finished fourth fifth sixth seventh ran okay you'd be going okay this is not the horse they think he is 
But the fact that he was beaten so early, he was the first horse beaten, he ran an absolute shocker, um, suggests to me that maybe that wasn't the real Augusto then. So I, I, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm obviously guessing, but it's a pretty educated guess that this is still a pretty top-class colt, I think. Excellent. Thanks, CJ. Uh, we know who you're going for for the derby, but if I could put you guys on the spot, where would your money be lying right now? Probably with military order and win value, but as a place value, probably wipe hero. Because I was, I was really taken with how he ran at, at Lingfield against military order. Again, the traction that have entirely suited him. And he's had a bit of a stop-start preparation, really. I'm sure if Ed Warg had the chance again, yeah. he would have entered him for the Dante this week. Um, I think it's what's going to be key for the trials this week and what might make the picture far more clearer is the weather. Uh, I, I live in York. I live a few miles from, from the race course. It's currently good ground and they're only due a chance of a shower today and then it's relatively dry. So we are going to get proper trials on proper spring racing ground, which could be the real key to, to mm -hmm. how we're going to view Epsom, really, because it's highly unlikely Epsom will be the similar as what it was at Chester. I mean, we don't know. It's, it's, it's the UK and the United Kingdom. Anything can happen with the weather. But all the, the weather and the signals are that the Dante will be the key trial this week. Maybe not even just for the Derby, maybe for the Prix de Jockey Club as well. Yeah. With yeah. Epictetus and uh, flying honours in there as well. Indeed, indeed. And Maddie, last, last word on this. I've had... Who's winning the derby? I've had far too many bets in the derby <laughs> already. I've nailed my colours to, to different masts. Um, but we'll go with the recency uh, bias take. I will go for passenger. I think if the ground is decent, as you say, Matt, that will really suit him as a son of Ulysses. Uh, I think he's a huge talent. And so Michael Stout, he doesn't mess around with the Dante, as we know. He knows a thing or two. Yeah, I'm going to go with you and with, with Piero each way as well. Uh, so rip up any tickets on that one. And finally, the last story, and this is the one I'm going to introduce. I think a very interesting story. Going back to jumps for a little bit here, uh, we've had some, some fa fascinating columns about superpowers in Irish jumps racing over the last uh, week. Uh, beginning with a, an Owen Griffin column uh, where he said it's becoming impossible for smaller trainers like me to compete uh, and action is needed for the sake of the sport. And his argument was that the uh, small number of superpower trainers who have come to prominence over the last 10 to 15 years are now completely dominating the sport. Uh, the big owners, with the exception of JP McManus, exclusively have their horses with this handful of top, top trainers. And he called for a rebalancing of the graded program, more opportunities for lower graded horses. Uh, he made a very interesting point that there's more grade one hurdles in Ireland than, than either grade twos or grade threes, which is, makes a mockery of the whole pyramid uh, idea. And following that, um, our own Chris Cook, uh, regular on the show, of course, uh, highlighted or, or argued that it's not so much a superpower problem, it's a Willie Mullins problem. Um, and just sort of reeled off some of the fascinating statistics around Willie Mullins' dominance, that he won more prize money in Ireland than the second, third, fourth and fifth trainers put together this year, uh, that the gulf between the 10th placed uh, trainer and the first placed trainer this year was 18 times prize money, and 15 years ago it was 3.8 times. Um, and then he also highlighted a very good point, which is that you know these this kind of trend is, is self-reinforcing because the prize money won then gets reinvested by the owners who uh, are, are pa uh, patronising these uh, top trainers exclusively. First of all, Maddy, is it bad for the sport to have this level of domination by a small or even an individual uh, trainer? I think so. Uh, Chris has long on this show been a champion of, of the powers that be taking more control to sort of redistribute um, or at least try and level the playing field in racing. And, you know, nothing against Willie Mullins and his talent and all that he's achieved over the years. But, you know, I think enthusiasm for the sport when it is dominated by not just an, a few names, but him. And he's, win you know, he's winning everything. He's got the first four in grade ones. Um, it does temper the enthusiasm slightly, you know, uh, people want narrative stories to get behind, um, people want people to, underdogs to root for, mm. um, they want competitive action. I mean, to be fair to Willie Mullins, he runs his horses against each other, which is more than can be said for, for some trainers um, in the way that they want to approach uh, how they campaign the very, very best, which is understandable in their own prerogative. Um, but I think with the way this trend is going, um, I was 
we had a discussion on this show about it. I was reluctant for um, the powers that be to get involved, but it's certainly looking like uh, it would be in their interests to take a look at what they can do. Um, because we want our sport to thrive and we want it to have a healthy outlook and it doesn't quite look like that's what's happening at the moment. Yeah, I, I think it's fantastic that this, this is finally being given the thought and attention it deserves because, you know, yes, Willie Mullins running his horses against each other is great, but you don't go to watch, you know, Ireland A versus Ireland B. You want to watch Ireland versus Scotland, Ireland versus England. You want that competition that comes from horses coming from different yards. Mm. It's, it, it's bad for the sport, I think, I, th I think, Matt, but, but what could be done what could be done to, to try and redress this situation? It's a, it's a really difficult one because if you are then stepping in and saying to owner, you can't have this pot, pot your horse with this certain person because he's, he's at the maximum limit. Say, mm. similar to, you know, we had salary caps in football a few seasons ago in the lower divisions. If you have a cap on the number of horses, you're going to leave owners, right, uh, well, in my opinion, rightly annoyed because if you are an owner and one who, who can afford to have the luxury of sending a horse to Willie Mullins, you want the best chance of winning. And if you want the best chance of winning, you'd send it to the best trainer. It's a difficult one, really. I think what also needs to happen in Ireland, a bit like what's happened here with the restructuring of the programme, is they need to have a look at a few of the races over there because some of them are just uncompetitive, completely uncompetitive. One of them, I remember Alan Sweetman writing in a column a few, few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago now, on trying to change the Morgiana hurdle in the, into a handicap. Yeah. I think that would be right because the last two runnings, you've only had two runners one, one runner in each race. So in 2021, uh, 22, uh, 21, sorry, it was Zana here from Gordon Elliott. And then yes, uh, last year, it was Jesse Evans from Noel Mead's yard against Willie Mullins' battalion. That's no spectacle, and that's not going to sell the sport, really, to, to punters or ooh, people outside it as well. And even with the Punchestown Festival this year, there were some really dull spectacles, yeah, really. Yeah. If you think to the Friday, yeah. as, 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 as lovable as the horses are, State Man and Imperial Pass, very good. But they just had to turn up like a piece of work, really. And mm. it's just not going to sell that element of the, the fun, competitive nature and, and the thrilling nature of, of what the sport, of what, we, what we know national hunt racing can do. We've had it in the past. So maybe it needs to redress the balance on that. Maybe a, a cap on horses could be the most serious way they take it. But it's a, it's, it's a thorny subject area because you, you then... It's one that other sports have tackled, though. Mm. You know, if you look at football, you look at Formula One. You know, sports which suffer problems around competitiveness have taken action to address it. It only really seems to be racing, which for so long has been comfortable with this. But, you know, perhaps because you very fairly make the point that owners are going to want to have trainers, have horses with the trainers they choose. But Maddie, perhaps that's just the sacrifice we have to make. You know, if it's, if it's a choice between some short-term pain to owners and, and some, some long-term benefits around the competitiveness of the sport, that feels like a, a, an easy one for me to... Yeah, as I say, I was initially against sort of putting sanctions on owners as to where they can send horses. Um, but I think it's worth looking into because it's a balance, isn't it? It's, there's no straightforward answer to this, unfortunately. Um, but what I would like to say is, I mean, you look at uh, the weekend just gone, for example, two fiercely competitive handicaps, won by Amanda Perrett, Kerry Lee on the flat and the jumps, two uh, female trainers who wouldn't have had the firepower that they used to have, let alone anything on the scale of the bigger yards, you know, John Gosden on the flat, Willie Mullins over jumps. They can do it. They can compete. And um, so much goes into winning these races, as we know. Um, you know, we've had another story that sort of relates to smaller trainers recently in, in Tony Mullins losing Princess Zoe and, mm. and things like that. And I think that just proves that there's so much for the sport to gain when uh, there are more. there's a more diverse group of people at the top of the tree. Um, so yeah, I think it's time to start looking at these things more seriously um, and just get our thinking caps on and think what we can do to improve the sport um, and see some more competitive, uh, more compelling racing. Yeah, DJ, um, anything, anything we did around um, caps on horses or, or, or entries would have to be done in lockstep between uh, Britain and Ireland. But from an Irish perspective, do you think there's any appetite for that kind of action to take place? I think it's getting there. Uh, I think Punchestown for a lot of people was a turning point. Um, that might sound stupid, but I think it was. I think it was a real 
oh my god this is actually quite serious now like i i said a couple of weeks ago like willie won 25 of the 37 grade one races in ireland this season uh, so i think at that 68 percent um at punchestown it was you know you can admire brilliance but you can also be bored by it and there was certain elements of punchestown that even me personally i was bored by um it's just it's just a little bit irritating for for your racing fan to be going racing and and have these odds on shots running against stable mates but then the flip side of that is and why it's such a you know a, a touchy subject is that if willie didn't run his second and third best horse against his first best horses in the in the different disciplines we would have no race at all so on one hand you're saying He's ruining the sport, and on the other hand, you're saying he's actually making the sport. So mm. it's really tricky. And 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 on the on the actual program, that's tricky as well because you want to have the best product you can possibly have. So if you're going to put in a whole host of meetings with not to 109 handicaps and not allowing the good horses to run in these races and facilitating the smaller trainers, the product is obviously much poorer. So. There has to be a happy medium somewhere, and I think I think there is a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. That and there has been a lot of changes made by Jason Morris and different people in horse racing Ireland to try and facilitate, you know, the the smaller trainers. And Owen made the point and made some very valid points in his in his column. And Owen is a you know a real good guy, uh, uh, and even having conversations with him, he's a clever guy. Mm. He's not he doesn't speak out just because you know oh somebody else is winning all the race and I'm not. It's not because of that. He actually is quite a, a thoughtful type of person, and he made so many valid arguments in in his column, which I thought was a really good read. And I do think that we we do need to look into more wholesale changes, probably. But it's funny, like if you were to ask me, right, what should we do? What should we do right now? What should we do to, to try and address the balance? Like, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know because every time I make the point for one side and I say, right, what's the point for the other side? They kind of even themselves out. So I, I honestly don't know what the answer is. And that's probably why I, it's probably a good sign that I'm not on the, the board of Horse Racing Ireland. <laughs> Give it time, DJ. Give it time. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure if some of the great and good of racing got together and sat down and thought about it, there would be some good solutions which would uh, improve the competitiveness of uh, racing, not just in Ireland but generally. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. We could keep talking to some of these subjects um, almost indefinitely, but it, the time comes to decide a, a front page story. And given the time of year it is, it's got. It's got to be the classic picture. It might be confusing as all hell, but it's fascinating. That's what we want from the classics. Uh, so congratulations, Matt, on your on your debut appearance and debut uh, victory. Um, and then it's only left for me to say thank you very much to you at home for tuning in. And please do, if you like the show, uh, like, comment, share, subscribe, and all the other things that you can do uh, to show the love or to get involved in the conversation. Uh, we'll be back again next week for more uh, racing debate. Uh, but I'll leave you finally with an advert for the Racing Post app. Give it a download and get lots more great Racing Post content on the go. Thanks so much.